All right, class, welcome to installment two of the video lectures for chapter two on fluid statics. If you haven't seen installment one, I recommend you go check that out pretty quickly because the next lecture is not going to make much sense without it. So uh, in the last video segment, we talked about this here fluid wedge uh, drawn by someone other than me, if the legibility doesn't make that obvious. And we showed that the pressure acting on all of these faces, that is PS, oops, the pressure acting on each face is equal under the assumption that this wedge is vanishingly small. That is, as it approaches to, uh, as it uh, approaches the uh, case of being a point in space. So this wasn't a wedge, in fact, at all. Um, but the construct of a wedge, because it has different faces with different orientations, is very useful for talking about the way that forces act in different directions. So by showing that there's a quality between the pressures acting on each face, uh, we concluded that pressure is, in fact, a scalar. So the next question that we asked ourselves, or that I asked you, and hopefully you asked yourselves, is how does the pressure vary within a fluid? If this wedge is represented by point A, how does the pressure at A compare to the pressure at B and the pressure at C? That is, we know pressure is a scalar, but... How does it vary in space? So let's go ahead and figure this out. Give me a moment to pull up my Here we go. So for this oops. All right, now in this case, um, because it's quite informative, I'm actually gonna go through the process of drawing the volume of fluid. And we're getting rid of the wedge. We don't need it anymore. We've already figured out that that angle theta doesn't make a difference in the pressure force acting on the angled face. So instead, we're gonna trade that in for a cube. Okay, so here's our cube, oriented along the x, y, and z axes. Okay, now um, remember that this has two types of forces acting on it. Let me make this full screen. We have our surface forces, right? acting on each face. Just to keep things uh, less messy right now, we're going to ignore forces in the x direction. Um, if you want, if you, don't re if you remain unconvinced after this lecture of what I have to tell you, you can go through the exercise in the x direction um, and see that the same thing applies. But we're going to look at uh, some of the forces in only the y and z directions once again because that will prove sufficient. So we've got uh, surface forces acting in the y and z direction. We've also got a body force that is the weight of the fluid element itself acting through the center of gravity of the fluid. Hey, okay, we're going to call this F B. Now remember, I said that in most cases, the uh, the body force is induced by 
the gravitational field. That is, it's the weight of the fluid. Um, other cases may involve, for example, um, crazy strong um, intermolecular forces or magnetic fields, if there were a ferrofluid or magnetic fluid, in which case you could have, um, you know, a giant magnet over here making the body force act this way. Uh, we're leaving the magnet out of it. But we're going to not assume that the body force is acting downward. Okay, we're going to put it at some uh, orientation. And uh, why is this? You know, you could you could ask you could ask me why why if I'm assuming that this is caused by gravity, doesn't it act straight downward? We're going to make it act at some angle theta. Uh, the reason is that we often solve problems in different coordinate systems, those that aren't necessarily aligned with gravity. For example, we'll see in the next video segment cases where, say we're solving for fluid acting on a surface at some angle theta. Okay, if this is a solid surface and we have fluid, and gravity can be pointing downward. Uh, however, instead of solving this in a coordinate system like that shown here, we're going to opt to solve it in a coordinate system that looks like this, in which case the gravity vector or the gravitational um, acceleration vector is not acting in the negative y direction. It would look something more like this. It would induce fluid body forces at some angle relative to the y-axis. So in the interest of keeping this very general, body force acts through the center of mass at some angle theta relative to the horizontal axis. We're going to go ahead and say that this acts in the um, at a constant x. We're not going to we're not going to direct it along uh, the x-axis. Or in other words, we could draw this as a 2D problem. Y, Z, here's our center of gravity, Oops. okay. So we're going to go ahead and say that the pressure measured at the center of this element, that is at the same point drawn here as the center of gravity, is given by P0 or P0. In addition, we're going to go ahead and specify the lengths of the sides of this element as uh, delta y. delta z, and of course, delta x. So, let's say we know the pressure at the center of this uh, p naught. That is, if we call this the origin, p naught equals the pressure at what? Delta x over 2, delta y over 2, delta z over 2, the middle of this cube. How then do we find the pressure acting at, or at, the, at this point, at this point, at this point, or this point? More generally, if we know f of x at some point x naught, then how do we estimate the pressure f of x, we'll go ahead and call this a vector, at some point x naught plus delta x 
a small distance away. The answer, and if you've got this in your head, good for you, is a Taylor series. There's a reason that the homework problem dealing with Taylor series was on homework one. And we're about to put it into practice. So give me one moment to snip this out and put it in the corner so that oops. Okay, sorry for the delay, guys. Just making sure that we can keep an eye on the problem while we work through the equations of motion. All right. So I mentioned here that uh, we can use Taylor series to determine the um, a function at a point uh, where the function is not known, as long as that point is somewhat nearby a point where it is known. Note here that by saying that pressure or p naught is equal to p at this location, I'm implicitly assuming that pressure is. Uh, is a function of position in space. Okay, uh, I haven't really decided anything about how pressure varies in a fluid by assuming this. Uh, you know, I could pressure could end up being, um, for example, simply a constant where it doesn't vary in the fluid, or it could be um, something where it varies as a sine wave. Uh, I'm simply saying that it is some function of the location within the fluid. What we're trying to decide and determine in this lecture is what kind of function that is. So the Taylor series expansion of pressure gives us pressure at x, y, and z is equal to approximately p naught plus the partial derivative of p with respect to x times a small distance in x plus partial derivative of p with respect to y times a small distance in y so on and so forth z delta z okay this is what we call the first order taylor series plus oops it'll it'll continue onward with um, partial x second derivative times to x over 2 plus so on and so on partial second derivative with respect to y partial second derivative with respect to x so everything that has an exponent of sorry this is supposed to be uh, I'll take squared everything with an exponent of greater than 1 uh, we're going to call a higher order term and we're going to leave them out. Why is that? Well, because just as we did with the wedge, we're going to assume that this cube becomes pretty small in space. That is, delta x, delta y, and delta z are going to start to shrink towards zero. And having these exponents on top of delta x and then on top of delta y, delta z, 
of anything greater than 1 means those things approach 0 extra fast. So they can be neglected whenever um, delta x, delta y, and delta c are relatively small. So it's quite common to see this first order Taylor series. Uh, second order Taylor series generally give you smaller errors. But again, the errors induced by these higher order terms shrink to zero faster than the errors induced, or than the than these um, these first order terms. So we're going to go ahead and replace everything beyond the first derivative. This higher order terms. So we can go ahead and come back to this uh, uh, this drawing of our cube now and populate what these pressures acting on the faces are approximately. That is, on this face, P naught plus delta Y over 2 delta X delta Z. On this face, P naught plus, um, sorry, this, that's not correct. dp dy times delta y over 2. y over 2 because the distance from this point to this point is delta y over 2 times dx dz now, y plus p dz times delta z over 2 dx dy in this face p naught minus dp dz times delta z over 2 dx delta y and on this face um, p naught minus, let me move this further out, p naught minus p dy delta y over 2 times delta z delta x. Okay, so we've, go ahead, we've gone ahead and populated these forces and um, give me another moment to clip this new revised drawing. and stick it in the upper right corner where we can refer back to it. Save desktop. All right. Now remember also that this body force is going to be equal to the mass of the fluid element, delta M, times what? The gravitational acceleration vector. Meaning, Fb is equal to rho of the fluid times delta x, delta y, delta z times g. So this, the direction of the gravitational field is what dictates the orientation of this body force vector. We're not going to write it into this figure up here. Uh, we'll simply sub, um, substitute it in when the time comes. So before... Um, oops. Okay, now before we do the, um, the sum of the forces in uh, each direction, let's go ahead and figure out what the resultant surface forces are. 
caused by the pressures acting on each face. So we're going to go ahead and write this as um, remember in the y direction and the z direction. We're neglecting the x direction for right now. So fy is going to be equal to p naught minus px. Oops. Delta p delta y. y over 2 times delta x delta z minus p naught plus partial p partial y delta y over 2 delta x delta z which is equal to what this cancels this cancels and we end up with negative delta p, or sorry, negative partial p, partial y, delta x, delta y, delta z. Right? Okay, how about the z direction? Delta f z is going to be equal to p naught minus partial p, partial z, delta z over 2 delta x delta y minus p naught plus partial p partial z delta z over 2 delta x delta y. It's going to be equal to, once again, we have a cancellation of pressure at the center of the element. These two add up, and by adding them up, we get rid of this 2 in the denominator and end up with partial p partial z negative delta x delta y delta z and so by extension we're gonna go ahead and uh, just write it in here but um, that the force surface force in the x direction would be equal to negative partial p partial z, um, sorry, x delta x delta y delta z so we have here the three components of the surface of forces acting on the cube, right? So let's go ahead and write this as a force vector, specifically a surface force vector, which is equal to surface force vector equal to delta F X I plus delta F Y J plus delta F Z K. Or if we substitute the values for each of these in, we end up with negative partial P partial X I plus negative partial P partial Y J plus negative partial P partial Z K all times delta x, delta y, delta z. Note, we've just factored out the delta, y, delta x, delta y, delta z terms from each of these. Now, recognize from your, uh, your calculus days that we have here what is called a gradient operator. And you should have also had some practice with a gradient operator in homework one where the gradient times f is equal to, or, well, let's go ahead and call it what it is. Gradient times p, that is a scalar function, p, is equal to dp dx i plus partial p partial y j plus partial p partial z k. So we're recognizing that that's what the gradient operator is. We know that this, everything contained in the parentheses here, is equal to negative grad p. Meaning, we can write the surface force vector in a very compact way by saying fs is a vector is equal to negative 
grad P times delta X, delta Y, delta Z. This is a pretty nifty uh, way to boil down all of this into this short little statement. Now we're going to also make another simplification where we say um, we want to calculate the surface force per unit volume. Meaning, oops, let's change that back to black, S over delta x, delta y, delta z, where the denominator here is the volume of our cube. It's just equal to negative grad p. Again, recall the body force. This little guy acting through the center of mass. F B. I know it's not written as uh, this way in the image in the upper right, but we're going to go ahead and call it delta FB because, again, it's small. All right. This is equal to rho delta x delta y delta z times the gravity gravitational vector, just as we showed here. I'll go ahead and add the deltas in front of that. Now say we want to calculate the body force per unit volume. Well, that's easy enough. Delta FB per unit volume simply equal, equal to rho times the gravitational vector. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, recognize oops, that these quantities in the boxes exist. Let's remember those, put them in our back pockets. We're going to come back to them. But in the meantime, let's go back to our sum of the forces on this cube that's in the upper right. So sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to acceleration in x times delta m. Sum of the forces in the y direction, acceleration in y times delta m. And acceleration in the z direction is equal to acceleration z times big surprise delta m. Since we're on a kick of putting things into vector form, let's do the same here. This means that sum of the vector forces is equal to the acceleration vector times delta m. We have the x component, the y component, and the z component. We're simply grouping them together using vector notation. OK. So if we write it this way, we have sum of the force vector is equal to what? Delta surface forces plus delta body forces is equal to mass times the acceleration vector. Now um, remember that we expressed all of these uh, per unit volume, the surface forces here and the body forces here. So let's go ahead and re-express that um, in this latest equation. Um, some of the forces per unit volume gives us delta Fs over unit volume, which is negative grad P. Let me make sure I'm doing this correctly. Plus some of the, uh, the body forces per unit volume, which is simply equal to rho g is equal to the mass per unit volume, which I shouldn't have to derive for you because that's the definition of density times the acceleration field. This gives us a very important equation. Rho g equals rho 
acceleration. Okay. I'm gonna put several colorful boxes around this because it is such a fundamental equation. Okay. This is the equation of motion for a fluid that doesn't have shear stress acting on it. That's it. Very, very useful thing to know. So, um, in the case, the very simple case, where, let's say, I've decided to be nice to you and I've given you a homework problem, where here's x, here's y, and gravity just happens to be pointing downward that day along the y-axis. This means that g is simply equal to negative, uh, we'll, we'll say, the, um, the magnitude, the gravitational acceleration magnitude, times j. So you'd simply plug uh, this quantity here, negative 9.81 meters per second, 32.21 feet per second, what have you, times the, um, the unit vector in the y direction into this equation, and you could calculate how the pressure varies um, with that. To take it in the other direction and make it even more general, remember I talked about how things besides gravity can induce body forces, things like magnetic fields. Let's go ahead and write it as negative delta or grad P plus the um, we'll go ahead and make the body force per unit volume a lowercase f equal to rho acceleration. So this is the body force per unit volume. This also gets a box. Okay, so we've gone ahead and derived the equation of motion for a uh, a, a fluid that doesn't have any shear stress acting on it. Um, great, but that still doesn't answer the question of how the pressure varies within a fluid that's at rest. So let's go ahead and use this newfound equation to answer that question we asked at the beginning of this video. So for a fluid at rest, we know that the acceleration is equal to, well, let me go ahead and write down what we're assuming, fluid at rest okay we know that the acceleration vector is equal to what I'm guessing none of you talk to your laptop, so I'll go ahead and give it to you. Acceleration is equal to 0i plus 0j plus 0k. All right, 0. 0, 0, 0. Can't accelerate if it's not moving. Which means that our equation of motion becomes an equation of non-motion, or static equilibrium, which we're going to write as negative grad p plus body force per unit volume is equal to 0. Um, because I hate negative gradients, we're going to go ahead and multiply this whole thing by negative 1. doesn't really change anything, but it simply makes it grad P minus body force per unit volume equal to 0. So I know we just went all vector happy and condensed everything we wrote into vector notation, but let's go ahead and split this back apart into its component elements. Right, so x y, z. This means that partial p, partial x, minus the x component of the body force is equal to zero. Partial p, partial y, minus body force in the y direction equal to zero, and partial p, partial z, minus body force in the z direction is equal to zero.
Great. What does this tell us? Partial P, partial X is equal to body force in the X direction, partial P, partial Y is equal to body force in the Y direction, and partial P, partial Z is equal to the X component of the body force. Great. So, um, again, in the case where the only body force is due to gravity and the gravity tends to be um, directed along some vector here, we could write this instead as dp dx is equal to what? Rho gravity component in the x direction. Partial p, partial x is equal to rho gravity component in the y direction and partial p partial z is equal to gravity rho times gravity in the z direction. If I'm being nice and gravity is equal to 0i well I guess as it's drawn in the upper right we'll say 0i plus 0j minus g okay then we'd end up with equal to zero equal to zero equal to negative whatever the magnitude of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared okay hopefully you're all following if not uh, feel free to ask questions about this stuff when I get back All right, so as a, uh, as a check on what we've done so far, what did this preceding derivation tell us? Um, well, we know that the pressure acting on a body, uh, the pressures acting on a body exert forces on the faces of that body. We also know that particles experience forces through their mass centers due to their gravity that is, the weight of the fluid uh, volumes themselves, and possibly other less common effects like gravitational, or like um, uh, Coriolis effects or magnetic fields. Uh, they also, so the, the pressure forces are those acting on the surface of the body, those shown in red up here, and the body forces are those which push and pull on the mass of the fluid itself. Uh, which is shown as the black vector here, delta FB. Okay, Newton's second law, F equals ma, tells us that unless the particle or volume, the particle or volume that we're considering is moving, the forces acting on it must balance out. That's why we set the a equals zero and uh, solved these equations here. So in order for forces to balance the pressures in the field must change continuously in one or more directions at a rate equal to the component of the body force in that direction. That's what we're showing here. Okay? The rate of change of the pressure in the x direction is equal to the body force per unit volume at component along the x-axis. It's because if the force is pointing this direction along the x-axis, the pressure has to increase continuously along the x-axis in order to counteract that body force in every single fluid element to keep the fluid from moving. All right, so let's go back to that tank of water with which we started the lecture. We've got our point A point B, point C. And because this lecture is getting long, we're going to go ahead and say gravity is pointing down. All right. Um, X, Y. A, B, C. So the question that I use to motivate the lecture at the beginning is how do pressure at A 
pressure at B and pressure at C relate to one another? Are they equal? Is one greater than the other? Less than the other? Well, we should be able to answer that now. So if we know, oops, let's go ahead and write the equation of, uh, of static equilibrium for the fluid in this case here. Since G is acting only along the y-axis, that is in the negative y direction, we have that partial P partial X is equal to partial P partial Z, zero. Partial P partial Y, however, is equal to what? Rho G, negative rho G in particular. meaning if we know the pressure at point A we know also that it has to increase along the negative y direction at a rate equal to rho g rho g that is the pressure at A increases with a slope for OG as we move deeper along the y-axis, meaning that the pressure at B must be greater than the pressure at A. Now how about B compared to C? Note, they are at the same position on the y-axis. They are, however, separated by some distance um, along the x-axis. We already showed that because gravity is only acting downward, partial P, partial X is zero. That is, the pressure does not vary along the x-axis, only along the y-axis. So because B and C are at the same y position, P, B is equal to pressure at C. So, we're going to take this through one more step before wrapping up this section of the video lecture. But the interpretation here, pressure varies linearly with body force. Per unit volume. Okay, if we're talking about gravity, that means the pressure uh, increases linearly with depth. We can say that if we know a pressure let's say this is at the free surface where pressure zero is equal to atmospheric pressure. And this is B. X, Y, gravity's acting downward. If we want to find the pressure at B, we can write pressure at B is equal to what? Pressure at A plus the integral from um, y a to y b partial p partial y times the y. We know that the rate of change of p 
only occurs in the y direction and that it's equal to partial p partial y. So it should be no, of no surprise um, that in order to find the pressure at pressure partial at point B, we simply integrate that rate of change over the distance over which it's changing. Simple as that. Um, now we know also that partial P partial Y is equal, equal to negative uh, rho G. So rho G is um, for the purposes of this lecture assumed to be constant. Note, we are assuming the density is constant in this fluid. That is not always the case. Certainly when you get out into the open ocean where the temperature varies with depth, your density can change with depth. And uh, I'd also like to point out that in your books, um, it incorrectly specifies that the definition of an incompressible fluid is one in which the density is constant. This is not correct. That is the definition of a of a um, homogeneous incompressible fluid, as where the fluid is everywhere the same. In general, the definition of an incompressible fluid is that what we call the material derivative is equal to zero. And we're going to get into this in the differential flow analysis of, I believe, chapter four. But for now, I know I'm throwing out a lot of things, telling you your book is wrong and whatnot. Um, we're going to assume that the density in this tank of water is constant. It means it's everywhere. It's the same. So we're going to move this to the outside of the integral, right? PB is equal to PA minus rho g integral from ya to yb up to y. This part here should simply be yb minus ya. So pb is equal to pa plus rho g yb minus ya. We're going to go ahead and call the distance between these h, okay? It's equal to yb minus ya. P, b. Oh, sorry. This is, um, this should be the other way around. ya minus yb. h is a positive value here. This is supposed to be a negative. I got ahead of myself. So PB is equal to PA plus rho G H. Important, we'll be using this a lot in the next lecture. We can also say that H is equal to PB minus PA over rho G. And this is the last thing I'm gonna tell you, I promise. This is what we call pressure head. Okay, for a fluid of known density, H tells us how high a column of liquid is required to induce the pressure difference that's in the numerator. So we'll get into this more in the next lecture. But in this lecture, we have covered quite a bit. Uh, we addressed the question of how pressure varies within a fluid. Oops. We, uh, by analyzing this differential element of a fluid, we derived the equations of motion for a stre uh, shear stress-free fluid. We turned that into the equation of static equilibrium, or the equations in each component direction of static equilibrium for that stress-free fluid. And then we use that to show that pressure varies linearly in opposition to the body force per unit volume. Finally finishing up by saying the pressure increases linearly with depth under the effect of gravity. So all of this is handily reproduced in the slide shown here. So in the next lecture, 
we're going to go ahead and le uh, learn how to use this knowledge to calculate pressure at different points within a fluid, regardless of the shape of the fluid vessel, and move on to show how uh, the fluid pressure acts on submerged bodies. So we'll be seeing things like why when they build a dam across a river does it tend to have a shape like this? And why when, for example, Mulholland built the St. Francis Dam in the 1920s, did this shape not work and the dam fall down releasing millions and millions of gallons of water into uh, several towns on its way back to the coast. See it all in the next lecture. Thanks for watching this.